Okay, I think you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear the mics on. So thank you very much, Livio and Stefan and Erland and every other co-organizer of this. It's really nice to be here and be invited to kick off this conference with a talk. So the title of my talk and the question that I want to spend the next 25 minutes talking about is how effective has macro prudential policy been? I'm an academic now rather than a central bank staffer, so I'm going to try and use that prerogative to be a little bit provocative with you. And this is offered in the spirit of trying to make your conference interesting, give you some food for thoughts over the next day and a half. So, yeah, let me start by, I guess, giving you some context of why I think this is an interesting question to ask right now. So my perspective on this is macro pru was like one of the big ideas that came out of the global financial crisis over a decade ago now. Um, you know, one way of trying to kind of explain what this was about is we saw a massive buildup of systemic risk that just went on completely unchecked at the system wide level in the early 2000s. And we needed someone to kind of take a step back and say, hang on, there's just too much risk taking. So that's really in simple terms what macro pru was designed to be, to, to achieve. And, um, you know, there's a number of really nice papers in the literature that documents how widespread the adoption of macro prudential frameworks has been around the world. So this is something that's got a lot of traction, I think. It's been used a lot. The one committee that I know best, the UK Financial Policy Committee, is 10 years old on a de jure basis. It's older than that, it's de facto. It's been operating since 2011. So I think kind of this is a really good time for us just to take a step back and say, like, is this working how we intended when we set this thing up? Let, let me put it in a, in a nice way. Have we achieved as much as we might have expected over this period in terms of developing the framework? Are there things that need a rethink? So that's going to be the kind of theme of my talk. Um, actually, before I do this slide, I will just, I hope this goes without saying, but this isn't about apportioning blame in any way. So as a central bank staffer from the majority of this period, I'm as responsible for anyone else. So this is mainly just trying to say, what can we learn from this experience? How can we make it better? So I'm going to try and divide my talk up into these four questions I have on the slide. So the easiest question is like, how active have macro prudential policymakers been? So I'll show you some evidence on that. I'm then really going to focus on question two, which is what's the incremental impact that macro pru has had over and above all the other reforms that happened after 2010? And I want to kind of underline and highlight the word incremental there. That's what I'm interested in. Imagine we had not set up the UK FPC, the ESRB, all the bodies that you have in your countries that perform similar roles, what difference would that have made to financial cycle dynamics, financial system resilience? Okay. My answers to those first two questions are going to be firstly on how active they've been. I think they've been pretty active. I'll show you some evidence, but these are not committees that have just sat on their hands. A lot of policy announcements have been made. My answer to the second question is going to be a negative. So I think it's quite hard to make a claim that these committees have actually affected financial system resilience in a material way. I'll explain that. Then the last part of my talk will try and it's a little bit more um, speculative, but I'll try and give you my reasons for why I think there's been a lack of action. And then I'll end with some suggestions for what we need to see going forwards. I hope that sounds OK. So let's start with the, I think, the easiest of those questions, which is how active have these committees been? Um, I'm going to focus on what I'm going to call discretionary policies. So I'm not at all interested in whether Basel III buffers have been implemented, whether the LCR was implemented. I'm, what I'm looking for is what policies have actually been introduced in response to judgments about the risk environments where these committees said, well, risks are higher than we thought. We need to tighten policy or vice versa. So that's the kind of focus. Um, then I'm going to try and make, make two distinctions, which I think are useful. So firstly, it's interesting just to know how these bodies operate. So is it mainly through recommendations, soft policies, or harder policy actions? 
So I'll show you some evidence on that. And then I'll try and distinguish between frequency and intensity in terms of what we've seen. All right, so the, you know, there's many versions of this type of chart I could have shown you. I'm gonna focus on two bodies that I think I know reasonably well, so UK FPC and the ESRB. They have different powers. Uh, I hope it's big enough to see on the screen here. So I'll focus on the left to start with, the UK FPC. So I've just gone back through the Bank of England's record, and whenever they've said they've done something, it appears in this chart. So the light blue bars are recommendations by the UK FPC, and the dark blue are hard powers. All of those hard powers are relating to bank capital, so they're mainly about CCYB actions. There's a handful of leverage ratio actions there as well. So big picture, what do I get from that chart? It looks to me like the FPC was very, very active initially when it was set up. That's because we had a capital shortfall, arguably, you can debate that, in the UK at the time, and the committee felt the need to bolster levels of UK banks' capital. So you get a ton of recommendations early on. After, say, 2015, it settled down, and we get something like two to four recommendations a year. That seems to be how the FPC is, is operating, or one per quarter that it meets. Then the ESRB, so they obviously have different powers. They don't have hard powers, um, so it's a more complex structure. The time profile is quite different there. So, but it looks to me again that the ESRB, it's been much more active since 2015 actually. But the big picture I want you to take from this is both of these committees, they haven't been sitting on their hands. There's been a lot of action in terms of announcements of policies. I think it's also interesting to ask where the boundaries lie. So which countries have pushed these tools furthest? Some of you may have superior information, so I do. I've been using the SRB's database, which is fantastic. So if, if I've left something out, do tell me. But it seems to me that if I think of the CCYB to start with, there's a bunch of countries now that have set two to two and a half percent buffers, um, predominantly Scandinavian countries. Um, there's within the EU something called the systemic risk buffer, a flat additional buffer, and again, it's Scandinavian countries that have that are kind of paving the way there. Risk weight flaws, Norway, I would point out, is the exception. And then on the mortgage debt side, which is the other kind of big plank where we've seen a lot of macro prudential action, to my mind, Ireland is the kind of poster child here in terms of the country that's pushed these tools furthest. So if you want to take out a mortgage as a second buyer, not a first time buyer in Ireland, the maximum loan you can achieve is three and a half percent of your gross income. So I think that's the limit in terms of what's been where these policies have been set. So big picture, we've seen a lot of action on on the policy side. So let's turn to the harder question. What impact have these policies actually had? And I'm going to split the discussion up into impact on bank resilience, impact on household balance sheets, and lastly, the impact on, call it shadow banking or call it um, market-based finance, whichever of those terms you, you find less offensive, if you, if you like. So let's start with bank resilience. I'm going to put this in a very strong way to make the point. So I think it's implausible to think that discretionary macro prudential policy has had a significant effect on the resilience of banks. And I'm going to, you know, there's going to be some exceptions to that statement, but I, I, I draw that conclusion for three reasons. So firstly, some big countries just haven't used these tools, the US and China being the obvious examples. Other countries have been using these tools, but really in fine tuning mode. So Germany famously set a 0.25% CCYB before COVID. I think it might be 0.5% now, but these are kind of small adjustments. Um, but the main reason I, I draw this conclusion is that even, um, even a 2.5% CCYB it's going to barely register for an internationally active bank in terms of how much resilience it's delivering. And I've got a, just a simple chart to illustrate this point. So this is from Barclays um, Pillar 3 disclosure this year. So the chart on the left is their risk-based capital metrics. One on the right is leverage. 
So the numbers you can see here on the left are risk-weighted assets, which are around 340 billion um, sterling. CT1 capital is 46 billion. And then I think if you're being really generous, the maximum amount you could attribute to um, the CCYB is just over a billion there. So it's, the reason is only a bit of whatever the UK is doing is feeding through into its CCYB rates. It's even starker in leverage space. It's just over 2 billion against um, exposures of Barclays of 1.2 trillion. So it's peanuts. Um, is what I take from this. In the UK context, I think it's actually a bit stronger than that. So the UK, in the UK explicitly offset what it did with the CCYB with reductions in Pillar 2 requirements. You know, and that's just what happened. So there was actually, by design, zero impact on overall bank capital requirements as a result of these policies debate whether that was right or not. I think you could even make the case that we would have had higher capital requirements in the UK had it not been for the UK FPC because it saw its role as providing a macro envelope for capital. So that constrained the degree to which micro prudential requirements could be could be tightened. Um, now I'm not judging here whether that was right or wrong, but just to, that that is what happened again. So let's turn to um, household balance sheets. So I think this one's a little bit harder. So there is substantial, very good empirical evidence now on the conditional effects of changing LTV requirements, changing LTI, these kind of mortgage debt limits. And let me again underline the word conditional here. So that, uh, and that includes, I should say, by Oscar, who's going to be my discussant in a second, who has very nice work on this. And I think a typical finding in that literature is um, when you tighten LTV requirements or LTI, you end up with a reduction subsequently in credit growth to households and in house prices. And these effects, they tend to be larger for emerging markets, and they tend to be larger for the more the demand side tools like LTV compared to bank capital. So, oh yeah, there's a little chart that kind of illustrates, you will have seen these type of, this type of evidence before, I suspect, but this is from, I think, one of the nicest papers in this literature by Alain Mattel from the IMF, using their database to look at the impact of LTV changes. And they show that, you know, in a plausible identification, you get an effect on household credit growth and consumption growth. So um, I'll use a cliche from UK advertising history that some of you might be familiar with. So it, the, the evidence here, I, th I think, says that macroprudential policies do what they say on the tin. So when you tighten these, these tools, you see a subsequent effect on credit growth and house prices. Now, that's a, that's a different question to whether we've actually used these tools aggressively enough to steer household debt limits to you know, a place that is correct or not. And I think the evidence there is, is not so compelling. So the chart on the left shows you the evolution of household debt to income ratios across a large number of countries over the last 10 years. So I've basically rebased every country's household debt to income ratio to 100 in 2013. And then you're, you're looking at the range and the mean and the interquartile uh, range as well after that. So basically, the average country hasn't seen any deleveraging from households since 2013. Um, that's the red line. Some countries have delevered a significant amount, others have levered a significant amount, but on average, it's been zero. Now, you could say, well, maybe the countries that have delevered have been the ones that have been using macroprudential policies a lot. So that's the chart on the right. So it, it kind of takes those changes in household leverage and compares them to um, the borrower-based actions in the IMF's fantastic IMAP database. And you basically get zero correlation between those two things. Now, I realize... Um, you know, there's a lot of endogeneity going on here, but just as a big picture point, there's no correlation between um, 
the usage of macro prudential policy here and outcomes in terms of household debt. Now, I think, I think that probably is the right answer. It's corroborated, I should say, by the way that some macro prudential authorities describe their own actions. So this quote is from a, a review that the UK FPC made in 2017. So it was kind of looking back and saying, what's been the impact of the policy actions we've taken on LTI and DSR? And their conclusion was, it's, these, these policies have only had a modest impact on household mortgage lending. And moreover, actually, they're, they're really there to ensure against a deterioration in lending standards rather than to affect debt at present. So I think that's, again, consistent with this story that we haven't really had a big impact. Then I'll finish this part with, you know, what the evidence, this is the easiest bit, what's been the evidence on um, the impact on the resilience of shadow banking or market-based finance. So, of, you know, you all know this in the room, we haven't really done anything in terms of policy actions in this space until very, very recently. Off, you know, on the other side of that, we've seen various risks actually crystallizing. The 2020 Dash for Cash episode, the events in the UK this time last year around LDI funds. So it's retrospectively, I think it's really hard to argue that macro prudential policies have been adequate in this space. And I, I doubt any of you would disagree with that conclusion. So let me ask the question then. So if you buy where I've got to so far, why do we think macro proof has been so timid over this period? And I think there are kind of three hypotheses, but you can tell me if you think I'm missing them or you have other ideas. So the first hypothesis I think is that these authorities just haven't seen a need to act more aggressively and or they just didn't spot the risks building. All right. The second hypothesis is, well, these authorities did see risks building, but from a cost benefit analysis perspective, the actions they would have had to take were viewed as too costly. So it could be a rational decision to, you know, an understanding that risks were building. Then the third one is more about incentives, and it's that the elected officials that have designed these regimes have deliberately made them a little bit toothless. Um, and not set up to take strong policy actions. I think there's an element of truth in all three of these, but I'll kind of go through my arguments in a second. So let's start with the, they didn't see a need to act more aggressively. I think it's the case, this is my sense, that macro prudential authorities in many countries have made either explicit or implicit judgments that levels of bank capital and levels of household debts were broadly in the right place. They were comfortable with the degree of leverage in the system, so they didn't need to act more aggressively. Now, time will tell whether that's the right judgment or not, but I think that is probably where they've ended up. I don't think we can make this same argument for risks in shadow banking. So the next charts will explain why I think that. So what I've done here, I'll focus on the chart on the left to start with. So I took the FSB's holistic review of the Dash for Cash episode, and you can do like a text analysis of that document and see which terms define that document, which are the most frequently occurring terms in that, in that document. And you obviously get things like money market funds and um, basis risk and things like that. And then I've just gone back through the Bank of England's FSRs and said, how frequently were these terms appearing before the fact, ex ante? And what you get is a, there's a pointer on this, but you get a, um, yeah, a kind of a, a ramping up over time in the focus that was the attention that was paid to risks in market-based finance, right? So it's not the case that we didn't spot these, and that, I don't think that conclusion is at all controversial. I've also done the same thing for the LDI episode that happened in the UK this time last year. So this. You might remember it as the Liz Truss mini budget. If I could put it in those terms, it probably rings a bell for you all. And there, what we see is again, I'd say some kind of increasing focus through time in risks um, relating to gilt market liquidity. The scale is very different. So I don't think this was like a flashing red light for the FPC. 
but it was, you know, you see an increase in those terms. But what you don't see is any real discussion about LDI funds themselves and liability driven investment. So that's the um, amber colored bars here. And you can see, apart from a, a tiny little box that appeared in the 2018 FSR, there was nothing at all. So we partly spotted these issues, but if we're being honest, we didn't spot the actual thing that went wrong. And then obviously there's a lot of discussion after the fact. But what I want you to take from this is there was a lot of attention pre-2020 to the risks building in this sector, but nothing was done. So why was nothing done? Um, so the second hypothesis is it's more of the CBA, the cost benefit analysis of acting just wasn't favorable. I think there's probably some truth to this. So the argument would be, these are international markets. If you take unilateral action in the UK, you're just gonna see activity moving, shifting abroad. So you'll lose some tax revenue or some GDP will be lost for no resilience gain. And it could be therefore, that the, you know, a lot of authorities around the world were pinning their hopes on FSB level action. And I know that was the case because I was there at the time. It, I don't think it's quite fully true at the same time, because if you go back through the record of the UK FBC, there, there just isn't a discussion that, you know, we thought about acting unilaterally and decided not to because we were worried the risk would, would spread. This is a point Paul Tucker has made, um, so it's not my point. So I, I don't, I think there's an element of truth to this, but it doesn't explain the whole thing. So let, let's come to the last point, which is we've set up these committees in a way to make them a little bit toothless. They're not really there to make tangible actions that affect resilience in a, in a significant way. Again, I think there's some truth to this. So most inst institutional frameworks out there don't have direct powers. Although in parentheses, that isn't true in the UK case. They, they can have any powers they ask for, essentially. Um, Livio mentioned this, but uh, I think there's a whole load of reasons why we have a bias towards inaction. The IMF called this out over a decade ago, and I think they were exactly correct. The fact that mandates are fuzzy, we have consensus decision making as a rule, um, we have remits that seem to expand year by year. All of these things, I think, have the effect of disincentivizing clear actions. And then I'm going to ask a provocative question in the third bullet, which is, has there been an excessive desire to coordinate with other aspects of policy? Have macroprudential policy makers been too unwilling to ask awkward questions, to ruffle feathers, these types of issues? My own view is that stress testing processes are symptomatic of this. So I think you can see some of these coordination problems in stress testing. I can expand on that in the Q&A if you like. I think I'm probably almost out of time, Livia, but you should tell me. So I'm going to finish with just... Um... I think I'm, I mean, I've got another five minutes or... or... Oh, have we? Yeah, okay. I guess because of that. I guess we have 10 minutes of discussion, so a good five well, minutes. Uh... I'm on my last slide anyway. Maybe I went more quickly than I anticipated. So I, I want to finish with, I guess, three thoughts for you for discussion in terms of um, things we might practically do and focus on as like people in this room who care about these frameworks and online um, to make the next 10 years more impactful and effective. So the first point I'd like to suggest is relating to stress testing actually, and it's whether we can reorientate the macro prudential dimension to stress testing to make it more about identifying risks and vulnerabilities finding out where the tipping points are in systems. So my own view of stress testing is we've got to a state where, again, I'll put it in a stark way because it's clearer that way. A lot of it is about um, reaffirming preordained positions that the banking system is resilient to catastrophic scenario X. That's, that's my view. I don't think we're learning a great deal from those statements. And I'd rather see a process that was um had more plural got to the word plurality to it in terms of the stress scenarios understanding well what level of stress would cause a problem for the banking system what types of risk is the system most vulnerable to 
because we know it's not resilient to all of these things, right? We've found with, you know, sharp but modest rises in interest rates that have caused big problems for lots of banks. So that would be the first suggestion to, some people call this reverse stress testing, but it's kind of moving away from the current process, which is about, yes, the banking system is resilient. Thank God we found that again this year, towards um, asking the questions of, well, what, what would cause it to, to tip over? There's a very nice, some of you might remember from the post GFC era by Marcus Brunemeyer and um, I think Arvind Krishnamurthy as well. And it's called Risk Topography. I see Sujit in the room who might remember this paper, but the suggestion was basically that we move towards a, almost a database approach of stress testing, where we say, here's a bunch of N shocks of different scenarios in terms of yield curve shifts, basis, basis risk and everything else. You will feed them to the banks. You tell us what the impact on your capital would be. And we over time build a, I don't know, a spectrum of responses in terms of which risks might create tipping points rather than this focus on a single risk scenario. So that's, that's the first idea. So the second one, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but it's, I wonder whether one lesson is that maybe operating these tools in a truly structural way is just too difficult. And we've tried with the CCYB, but I wonder whether we should be thinking about building more structural rules-based elements into the regime. I think that's probably where I am actually. And then the last point is whether there are things we can do that would incentivize greater action. And I'll, you know, I think these are obvious points, but I think there should be voting on macroprudential issues. If you're an external member of a policy committee, how can you possibly influence the debate if, you, if your votes isn't individually registered? Um, I think there should be work to kind of unpack some of the expansion and remits that we've seen over the last decade towards narrowing down the focus towards systemic risk issues. If you go and look at the FPC's remit, for instance, you'll find all things about international competition, competitiveness. It's all in the secondary objective, but these things affect the focus of the committee, I would say. And then lastly, this is more a research point, because I guess this is a research conference after all. So I'll end with some something on that area, which is whether, um, you know, should we should we be doing more research to clarify the objectives of, of macro pru? And Liv, Livio, I did mention GDP at risk at the very end there. I like I I wouldn't say that's the only focus at all. I'd like to see a much bigger effort to try and understand the properties of different different metrics. Your bank equity at risk is, a, is an interesting idea, too. Stop there. Thank you. So thank you, David. Very fascinating. So I think we 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 give, give the floor to to discuss, and then we have a, perhaps a, you know a few minutes for for question and discussions. So are you online? Thank you. Okay. Cool. Super. You can go ahead. Also, you can go ahead. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Livio, for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper by David. It's Osgea Quincy. I am from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, so the usual disclaimer applies here. So what is the paper about? As we all know, after the global financial crisis, many countries have implemented macroprudential policies. And David is asking how well this new framework is functioning. And as we all heard now, he's a bit critical on the, the effectiveness of these macroprudential tools. On the bank side, it's not clear whether discretionary cyclical macro pro have significantly affected the resilience of banks. He also showed us some compelling evidence on the household side. We have seen that service to debt income and debt income ratios have fallen for most advanced countries over the past decade, decade but it's not clear if this deleveraging is the result of macro pro. So, um, so I I agree with so it's a it's a very compelling evidence, and I agree with with basically everything David said. So what I'm going to do today for my presentation is I'll think about some of the questions that David uh, put forward at the end of his presentation. 
And it is basically he asked how the framework needs to evolve going forward. Do we need to think balance between cyclical and structural policies? Can we revise the framework uh, to clarify objectives such as GDP at risk? And uh, he also mentioned that whether we can reorient the macro proof to stress testing to make it more identifying the underlying vulnerabilities. So in my presentation, what I will do is I'm going to rely on my recent research. It's called Financial Instability, Real Interest Rates, uh, joined with my colleagues from the Fed and also Gianluca Benino. Um, and I'm going to use this concept to try to address some of those questions. So what we do in this paper is to come up with a summary statistics and for financial stability, and we call it for we call it R double star, and it is very much like R star used for macro conditions. If the prevailing interest rate in the economy is greater than R double star, and we call that it the, the then the economy is faced with financial distress episode. But for me to try to, to explain you what R double star, I guess I need to step back and um, define what I mean by financial distress. Just to formalize the idea, I'll very briefly tell you a very simple model of uh, banking stress. So we have this like simple model with the banks at the core. We could call them financial intermediaries, but for like simply it is banks. Um, and they are gonna be investing in risky and the safe assets, right? And they are and the risk assets have a price of the Q, which is the asset price. And they are gonna be collecting deposits and they also have their equity value. And the network is going to evolve, the equity of the banking sector is going to evolve as this, as shown in the second equation, they are going to be collecting return on safe and risky assets, but they also pay dividends to the household. What is critical for us to think about the constraint and here the financial, whether the economy is in the financial stress episode or not is determined by this occasionally binding leverage constraint. So the total leverage of the banking system has to be less than or equal to the maximum leverage allowed. But what is critical here is that in the banking system, the banks could be investing in safe asset and also in the risky asset and the composition between safe and risk asset or the, co the so-called reach for yield determines the risk taking capacity or the leverage constraint of the banking system. So in this world, we have the when, the, when leverage constraint is not binding, we are in a stable regime. And if the financial constraint is binding, in the second case, we have the financial instability regime. And in that world, we have that the nonlinear financial crisis dynamic are kicking in so that we have like well, spreads, uh, credit spreads have been very large and volatile. And by definition, the financial stability interest rate is a threshold trade of interest rate at which this leverage constraint becomes just binding. The mechanism is through the asset prices. If the interest rate change, asset prices move, and then this makes this moves the leverage in a way that we find a fixed point at which this leverage constraint is equal to the maximum leverage. Why I think this type of concept, financial stability interest rate, useful for the design of macroprudential policy, because like financial stability, this concept is dynamic. What do I mean by that? So when, for example, if the economy has uh, a shock, right? So if the economy, the monetary policy is kept low for a persistently, for a long period of time, what matters for financial stability is not in the initial impact, I guess, but it is the dynamic effect, what happens after a few years. And in this example, I'm showing the dynamics of financial stability rate in response to low interest rate. The upper panel here shows the real interest rate. The middle on the up is the credit expansion in the economy. And the last panel on the upper side is the financial stability gap. On the lower panel, I show bankers' net worth. 
share of safe assets, and finally, I show maximum leverage. When interest rate decreased and stay low for an extended period of time, it is good for the economy in the short run, right? Because it is going to be a booming asset pricing, so the credit is going to expand. And we see initially financial risk are, are, are released. However, what is important is the evolution over the next few years, over the next three in, in our model simulation, it's going to be over the next three years. Faced with low interest rate, the banking system might be taking more risk because now they are going to be reaching for yield, right? And as shown here, the share of their safe asset in the balance sheet is going to be diminishing over time. After three years, we see that it is like much small. The implication of it is that then the risk taking capacity or the leverage ratio or the how far they are from the leverage ratio is gonna be increasing. So they are gonna be much closer to the leverage ratio. It and this in turn implies that the financial stability gap narrows down significantly. So the persistently low rate today causes vulnerabilities to build up, and that is gonna reduce the monetary space for financial stability. How it is related to GDP and risk, and why that argument might uh be valid for in, in this concept because the, what I show you was the financial variables. If you look at the evolution of the distribution of GDP and credit spread in response to same shock, low interest rate shock, what we see as before, not like I'm showing here the median and also the whole distribution of GDP. In the beginning, it is good for the economy, but over time, there is more and more risk at the, especially after three years, we see that the after persistent low rate, vulnerability is built up and economy, GDP becomes more susceptible to negative shocks. And as you see, the lower tail of the distribution is more affected. Why it is important? Because as these vulnerabilities build up and what happened now, for example, uh, persistently, like now, uh, unexpected increase in interest rate. If that that increase in interest rate hit in a period in which that the financial, the economy is in a vulnerable period, as I show here in the red line, uh, if if the shock and interest rate increases well by one percentage point, which is not a large increase yet. If that happens in a in a period in which the economy is highly vulnerable to uh, because of the underlying financial conditions, then we might see that the interest rate, financial stability rate gap difference between the R star and R double star can turn into negative with dire consequences for the economic activity and the spread. So monitoring the this type of index or monitoring financial stability or r star relative to r double star over time and keeping track it might give us hint that whenever r double star gets closer to r star it suggests that trade offs might be imminent between the financial stability and macro prudential stability and in this context, we we could see that like we can show as like in, as, as I show in the figure here, macro prudential tools, especially rule based capital requirements. It is the, the way we define is it that whenever the banking sector equity position fall below a certain threshold, then bankers are forced to issue more equity at a constant rate, and also this rate is time varying. So it could potentially eliminate this trade-off and reduce the downside risk to GDP and the credit spreads. Like as, as shown here, in a, in a world with macroprudential, we have that the fat tail of the right, like this right, right tail of the distribution is greatly reduced in a world with macroprudential policy. So just to summarize, we my thoughts on those discussion topics are. The less financial stable economy is more vulnerable to bad shocks, but its response to good shocks is not different than before. So it is worth really to try to clarify the objectives of the macroprudential tools or policies such as GDP at risk. 
And in the face of bad shocks, even those shocks are small, a trade-off between the, the so-called R star and R double star may arise. And as we've shown in this case, rule-based macroprudential tools such as capital requirement are desirable to, to avoid this trade-off. What like my metric was in the paper, what my metric was the welfare, and I've shown that both structural and the technical tools uh, are welfare improving. However, we cannot to push these tools too far away because one needs to balance between preventing tail risk versus uh, reduced credit for non-financial corporations today. Finally, uh, like this is a dynamic concept, as I said, and monitoring this type of statistic, summary statistic, can help identify underlying vulnerabilities. And the idea, again, is just to summarize that it is very similar to a stress test. Here, we measure how large a surprise increase in the rate the economy can bear before tilting into a crisis. And this concept can definitely be implemented in, in, in the context of a more, uh, like more complicated model with the, the several underlying vulnerabilities present. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. No, this is very interesting. And we, uh, you know, I, I think we all start using the R double star, uh, you know, like we use the R star. So it, it's going to be maybe slightly confusing. Um, so the, um, we have time for we have good time for for a few questions. So I would say, if you agree, I collect a few and then you would respond collectively to them. You know, uh, uh, so okay. So one over there. Yeah, let's start there. Uh, th thank you, um, Alistair Ryan from from Bank of America. T to David's point, it's hard to see the impact of macroprudential policies on bank capital. It's fair enough because for other reasons, bank capital was doubling or tripling depending but it's very clear the move of credit from the banking system to the non-banking system so when you're thinking about future projects what's the weight you put on stress testing off for banks and what's the imperative to address macroprudential risk in, in non-banks which have been substantially all of the increase in credit for the last 15 years in in, in most european countries thank you Okay, then there was one uh, in there, and then Sujit. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for both the presentation and the discussion. Super, uh, super insightful. I also like that uh, you know that people from outside challenge uh, you know the, the regular uh, the regular vision of macroprudential policy. But I wanted also uh, you know to put uh, a bit uh, a response uh, like more, more probably central banker response. That is, uh, what about heterogeneity? In a sense, for example. Uh, uh, for borrower-based measure, the idea is also that uh, we don't want to necessarily tackle credit growth, and so this is actually a cost of the economy. So we we somehow interpret it uh, sometimes as a cost for the economy, and instead, what we want to try to do is to to tackle the the, the, the tail of the distribution that is more vulnerable. So uh, from from that perspective, you could say that macroprudential policy can be effective uh, on, on the tails, avoiding that this fraction of people. For default, so I was wondering whether you you can take this also into account uh, in uh, assessing the effectiveness of macro. Thank you. Then we move counterclockwise. I mean, Sujit, you had one, and then there are a couple there, and I saw them. Thanks very much, uh, Sujit Kipadi from the ECB, and thanks, David, uh, for the really nice uh, talk. Um, in terms of the lack of action that's had impact, and especially I'm thinking also in the non-bank space, to what extent? You, then you sort of touched on it, but political constraints and lobbying pressure, what role do you see that as having played? You mentioned the UK's FPC com secondary competitiveness objective, but we know that in continental Europe, in the US, you know, everybody's trying to promote their financial sector. We know that there's strong lobbying, say, from the asset management sector, and that essentially a lack of action has been reflective of the political environment and political constraints that are Im implicitly or explicitly being internalised in the way in which macroprudential authorities have acted or in fact not acted because they're concerned about those uh, political constraints. Thanks. Okay, so we move this side then. Um, Stefan? Yes, um, thank you to, to, to both. Uh, Stefan Farr from the ECB. 
so so you the proposal at the end is uh, that you made David was uh, about stress testing no review stress testing looking at uh, at the risk topography and where is it that that the the system would break so to say now a bit uh, the, this difficulty that I I see kind of in this manifold is is having structure and flexibility um, and and how to manage it so on the one hand we would like to go doing that you no know, on a structured manner we've got like even 10 risks and we kind of send it to the banks and then uh, please answer and then it comes back and it would give us for those 10 you no know, which ones is the closest to to the breaking uh, point nevertheless risk is also about kind of identifying new areas and new kind of maybe you have thought about that and how to balance the two going forward thanks thank you Stefan. there was another one there thank you uh, Christoph Bastian, University of Zurich. Thanks for the interesting presentation and discussion. Regarding stress tests, I'm wondering whether you're not concerned that uh, stress tests would capture one scenario and entirely miss another one. So I'm wondering whether it wouldn't be more robust to tie the CCYB to a sufficient, sufficient statistic like just a policy interest rate. Um, not perfect either, but it might capture more relevant scenarios maybe. Thank you. Any, any remaining questions before we give the floor back to David? I mean, I also add a, a bit of a spin to what the Suji said in terms of political economy. So one story that I've heard in Asia is that, uh, you know, one constraint on Macro is also, you know, real estate prices, you know, because, you know, think of Hong Kong, you know, the, the, the real estate prices are, you know, incredibly high, uh, but, uh, but the authorities cannot touch it because it's also a source of wealth for, for citizens. Mm -hmm. So any macro measure that reduces real house prices is, is, is you know, is going to be, uh, you know, politically feasible, which also keeps the prices also you know, at this very, very high level. So, yeah, so there's a bad equilibrium. Um, I don't know how you want me. You have got a lot of feedback and, you know, take your time, but uh, yeah, yeah, probably five minutes is a, will be okay. And then we need to move to the panel. <laughs> um, you give me a kick if I'm taking more than five minutes. Okay. Um, I might start with the Livio Suja point, excellent point about political economy. Um, you're of course right. That's quite a damning criticism of these. I would say that's an even more damning criticism than the one I gave you. So, you know, I I thought what we were trying to do with these regimes is kind of make them sufficiently independent um, outside of the political process with independence on them um, to allow them to kind of raise difficult issues and be a layer above those, certainly those lobbying issues which affect all these debates. So I don't doubt that huge lobbying has happened from the asset management industry, certainly. We all know that. Um, but if that's actually led to an unwillingness to call out the risks and to do something about it, that's that's quite a serious critique, I think. You may well be right. Um, and your point about real estate is certainly correct in a, in a number of countries. But the same point should apply, right? If these, if these bodies are really worth their salt, you know, it has to be to ask questions and to call out issues that are threats to stability. Otherwise, literally, what's the point, I would say? Um, so, yeah, I'd like to think more about that, but that's my immediate response. Um, Alistair, you raised a very good point. Um, yeah, you're totally right. There's a nice chart in the um, speech by Andrew Hauser from last week, which I think illustrates the point you're making, that at least in the UK context, and I bet this is true in in Europe as well, that all the kind of credit growth we've seen on a net basis has been in the non-bank sector. Um, and that's undoubtedly a reflection of lots of things, but Basel III would be one of the things that's certainly caused that. I don't I don't disagree. Um, Sujit and I actually wrote a paper many years ago, but it's actually just been published in the Bank Underground series, which tried to kind of present a little model of the CCYB and say, how would you adjust this instrument if you what would optimal policy be different if you had a market-based finance sector that was growing? And our conclusion was, well, you kind of use this tool less because it's less effective. Because every time you use it, you're pushing stuff into the non-bank sector. I, somebody asked me about that the other day. I think it is right, but we know banks are also critical to stability. Liquidity provision is, is crucial. So I don't want to underplay how important it is to get, get bank resilience rights. So I would kind of mitigate a little 
or water down the conclusions from our paper, I think, a little bit in, in that regard. But your, your point was really, where should the focus be in terms of fixing issues? And I, I think you're exactly right that it should be in the non-bank space. That's the area where we don't have micro prudential standards. So it's the obvious thing that macro pru should have been set up to do. Um, your point was a very good one. Yeah. I don't have a great deal to say about that because the data are not so available. Your point was about, you know, is this about cutting off the tail of risky borrowers? M maybe one point I will make is um, it's not obvious to me where you look in the tail. If, you're, if your um, objective is macro prudential policy, that should, if you think GDP at risk is at all related to what you've been set up to do, we're looking not to kind of make every individual borrower resilient in the economy, but we're, we're worried about threats to GDP stability. And I think that suggests it can't just be the far tail of the most highly indebted borrowers in the economy. There's a chart that the, um, the UK FPC show in every FSR, which is the number of borrowers that have DSRs. It's, I forget the number, but it's really far in the tail, and it's like 1% of households are in that position. I kind of feel like that's not the right place to look as well, because that is not a threat to GDP in the UK, I would argue. It's a big deal for those individual households. So I think I agree with your point, but I don't know exactly where you should be looking, and I think it's not at that degree of, of, of tailness. Um, Stefan, well, I've written down all the questions, but your, yeah, your question's a very good one. I mean, we don't have to decide between one approach and another right your point was around stress testing and how much flexibility and structure there should be i kind of feel like all the emphasis on single scenarios is a massive mistake and it's leaving us blind to kind of where the risks are so i would like to see a move towards something that's you mentioned this 10 thing there's another nice paper 10 by 10 by 10 that explores a similar idea and i think these are things that should we should be trying to move in that direction for, for my money. Um, but that shouldn't kind of offset the, or, or shut down the idea that occasionally we say, well, this is a big risk. We're going to add it to the things we want to find out about you guys. Um, Christoph, I think you asked a question. Um, I do agree that we shouldn't tie the CCYB to stress testing because it's a backward looking concept that currently isn't telling us very much about the level of risk. Um, I would not agree that tying it to the interest rates would be a good idea because I think these cycles operate on different leads and lags. So I wouldn't like that either. I'm not telling you what I would like there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, any any last word from uh, the other side of the Atlantic? Do you have any last comment? No. Can I just thank Oscar as well? I, I forgot to do that at the beginning. Oops. Oscar, I'd just like to thank you as well. Sorry, I should have started by doing that. So thanks for your, your insightful comments. Um, can I just make one point on our double star, which is, I think that's, it's a great concept and it's been very influential, obviously, in the last year and a bit, given that interest rate risk has been the main, main issue. Um, I, it feels to me from the model you presented that it's actually leverage that we should be looking at rather than the interest rates. That's the more direct measure of of where the risk is. So that would be my only question for you in terms of, should it not be a leverage measure that's the, the metric, the key metric for financial stability rather than trying to map that into an interest rate? Perhaps let's not, let's not start a long discussion on this. <laughs> right, yeah, just very, very briefly. There, this is just a summary statistics. It's not only leverage. That is what we argue. It is other financial variables like the risk ratio or how uh, safe asset to risk or the risk taking capacity of the banker and all other financial variables is just summarized in one measure, which is the R double star. In this framework, it's again, not only how leverage moves, but how it moves relative to the capacity, which is very hard to measure. And we are here providing a framework to, to summarize it in terms and, and convert it into an interest rate space. One could definitely follow like several financial variables, spread, leverage, but um, again, this is 
our argument is that it's a summary statistics and it, it is in that sense, it's useful also to be able to compare it with the with the prevailing interest rate in the economy. So, so any the system, as you know, is super complex, hard to come up with these measures. But you would agree, you would agree that measure. you would agree that any kind of uh, macro prudential policy rule would have like something like you know, capital requirement as a function of R double star. So R, R double star would be on the right side. And, and some measure of capital or leverage would be on the left side. If I so the way I think about it, these are variables that you follow, like you observe or you don't observe, but you can recover. And then comparing or seeing how they evolve will give you an idea how or when the, this type of macro prudential policies could be activated because the objective is to try to avoid the trade-off. And we just telling you under which conditions that trade-off may arise. And I have shown you that with the use of macroprudential policies, one can release or like get eliminate, right? Or el remove the conditions under which you will get into a trade-off position. So you will keep using monetary policy for price stability and then macroprudential policy, if it was activated enough to have the financial system more resilient, would not bring you to that vulnerable state where the financial stability rate being binding. So that is, I think, still I would do the usual macro and the R double star and other variables I would follow and compare the dynamics of it. It is not really the static concept. I'm think I'm telling you, it's really the the whole dynamic of uh, how our star and our double star evolve relevant for the design of macro proof. So it's not as simple. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for a great session. I guess a round of applause is uh, 